for hope when you're in a hopeless place. This is the situation with the prophet, or that the prophet Zephaniah, who we'll be looking at this morning, was speaking into. He was speaking hope to a people that were hopeless. Uh, so with this Advent series that we've been in for the last couple weeks now, uh, as a church, we prepare to celebrate Christmas together. For what That is what the Advent season is all about. And as we prepare for that, we've been considering the prophets of the Old Testament who pointed to a future hope who was yet to come. That is, the hope of the nations, the promised Messiah who was to come, who would be Jesus. But before we dive into the passage that we're going to be reading this morning, uh, we need to consider, as we have the last couple of weeks, the context that these verses fall into, which is the book of Zephaniah as a whole, written by the prophet Zephaniah. So this book, it takes place during the reign of the King, king Josiah, who you may or may not uh, be familiar with, who was a, a good king of Judah. He was a child king. I can't remember the exact age he took the throne, but I know he was a child. But he made uh, good moves with the people of Judah. He reformed the people, and he tried to reestablish the worship practices that had been uh, stopped for a time among the people of Judah. The prophet Zephaniah in his book also speaks a lot about the day of the Lord which was to come, which will both involve a judgment against those people who sin against God and on the other side blessing for those who follow him. It's also important to note that during the time that Zephaniah was a prophet when he wrote this book, uh, that the northern tribes of Israel, so the other tribes other than Judah, had already been exiled. And in this book, God mentions uh, through Zephaniah, this prophet, that Judah and the other nations around them, including the Philistines, uh, Moabites, Ammonites, Cushites, Assyrians, and others, would face the same consequences uh, if they chose not to turn back to God. So we'll be looking specifically at the last several verses of the third chapter. So I gave a brief overview of the whole book, but we'll consider also the first part of chapter 3 as well. So the first section of chapter 3 of Zephaniah speaks about judgment. It speaks about judgment that is coming on Jerusalem or Judah. And this judgment that was coming because they had not trusted the Lord as He called them to. They had not draw, drawn near to Him. They were rebellious. They had defiled themselves. They would not listen to God. And even many of the priests and prophets uh, that had been called to lead the people were not following God. It also, it, it, in, in that, it speaks of the judgment that will be coming upon them. But after uh, the first eight verses, which speak of the judgment that is to come, if you look at the middle section in chapter 3 of Zephaniah, the, there's some verses that actually speak of the conversion of the nations. They speak of the time when the people will again call upon the name of the Lord, when they will again worship God, and when the people will be humbled from their place of rejection, and they will eventually seek God again. So as mentioned in the context of this, this short book, of Zephaniah, Judah was seeing the judgment that was being poured out on the other tribes of Israel. They were seeing God's judgment on the other nations around them. And they were hearing of the judgment that they themselves would also soon be facing. So it was a dark and a difficult and a desperate place that these people found themselves in. Perhaps they had lost hope in such a difficult situation, not knowing what was to come. Yet in the midst of this dark and hopeless place, God, through Zephaniah, this prophet, speaks of a time of restoration for Israel, a future time that they can hope for, that they can hope towards. So let's read those verses together at the end of this book. So it's Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, verses 14 to 20. Hopefully you can find it. It's between Habakkuk and right before Haggai towards the end of the Old Testament. Okay, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. 
On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in. At that time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So after all this, the ju- they've heard of the judgment that was coming. They've heard of, they'd seen the judgment and things that were happening to the nations around them. And yet, Zephaniah here speaks of a time to come when Israel will be able to rejoice, when they will be able to be restored and have restoration. And this morning, we lit the candle of joy together, reflecting on the joy that Jesus brought to the, to the world as he was born. Jesus can offer joy to any who would choose to follow him. And it's a joy that does not depend on circumstance. It does not depend on what you're going through each day. For whatever we deal with in this life, from day to day, month to month, year to year, through Jesus Christ, we have hope in the life to come that has been mentioned a lot over the last couple weeks. And no matter what you're facing today, no matter what you have gone through in the past, no matter what you will face in the days to come, you can have joy in the Lord. That's the truth. This can be hard though. I'm not saying that it is easy, always easy to have joy in the Lord, whatever you're going through. I'm saying that it is true that we can have joy in the Lord. And this here is what we hear from Zephaniah who says to the people, sing aloud, shout, Rejoice and exult with all your heart. Rejoice, be filled with joy. He speaks of a time when the Lord will take the judgments away from them and all their enemies will be cleared away so that they can rejoice and be thankful for what God has done for them. For while at that moment that Zephaniah was speaking to them, these people were facing impending judgment for their repeated rejection of God. In the future, they would have a chance to be restored to be able to turn back to the Lord. And this is something that you see in a lot of the prophets of the Old Testament. One that was spoken of a lot, I remember from college, was my uh, professor spoke from Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, where he, uh, the prophet was saying to the people, through, or God was speaking through Zechariah to his people, saying, return to me and I will return to you. For God was calling his people to love him to follow Him, yet they had wandered for so many years. But God is faithful. God has been faithful. God will be faithful to His people, even when they don't deserve it. Even when His people of Israel, the nation of Israel, were faithless, He would be faithful. Yes, they would be punished for their repeated rejection of God and following after other gods, But ultimately, they would have a chance to choose to return to the Lord when the promised Messiah, when their Savior came to earth, who is Jesus Christ. Just thinking on God's faithfulness, it's so incredible. And I remember being struck by this repeatedly uh, during my time at Bible college in many different ways as I studied, as I both studied the Bible and then also thought back on my life to that point. And as I was thinking of that, I thought of nice way to reflect on that and think is look at a couple of these notes that I wrote as I was in Bible college. This one was from 2015 and we were asked to think of ways that God had been working in us and one of them I wrote was how God was showing me that He is faithful even when we are faithless, both in my life experience and studying the Bible and then being uh, we were also told to think from your life, how God has uh, cared for you throughout your life. And the thing that I wrote was, God was faithful to me. Even in many years, I lived completely for myself, just like Israel. And then this is from another time uh, in Bible college as well, 
when we were writing uh, what God had been showing and working in us, and I wrote, uh, God is faithful even when I am totally faithless. And then I wrote, uh, I was not seeking the Lord at all in my high school years, in my younger years, but I'm thankful to the Lord that I never got into alcohol, partying, all the other things that come along with high school and especially being a part of a football team. Even though I was not seeking Him at that time, He protected me and was carrying me along always. He was faithful to me even when I was faithless. And I'm thankful that I can look back and think of those times, the lessons that the Lord was teaching me and that He continues to teach me today. But it's true. If you look at the story of Israel throughout the Old Testament, this is what you see. You see God's faithfulness to His people, continually blessing them, continually reaching out to them. And you see Israel's faithlessness. You see their lack of faith. And that they continually turn their back on Him. There's many places you could look, but specifically a couple ones I think of. One that Pastor Tony and I were speaking about recently is in the book of Hosea. I don't know if you're familiar with this book, with this story. But in this book, uh, God tells his prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. And he tells him to love her and to care for her. Even after she repeatedly leaves him and goes after other men, he is called to complete, continually love her. And this shows God's love for the nation of Israel because like a prostitute, they left him and went after other gods repeatedly, repeatedly throughout the whole Old Testament. You can see this. They continually walked away. They turned their back on him. They ran after these other gods and God still continued to love them and care for them and call them back to himself. And you can see it also, I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Judges, but it's an interesting book, many interesting stories of the judges who served Israel. But there's a cycle that is, goes on throughout the book where it continue, each judge, each story, you see this same cycle. It starts off with the people of Israel falling into sin or idolatry or following other gods. After this, they are enslaved by another nation. They cry out to God for help. God raises a judge or someone who, to help them. They're delivered by this judge. And then each story ends by them turning to the Lord and serving Him wholeheartedly. And then as soon as that happens, then the next story, they fall right back into sin and idolatry. The cycle keeps happening. Even as God saves them, even as God blesses them and cares for them, they still continue to turn their back on Him. They constantly turn their back on God. And as I said before, in this book of Zephaniah, Judgment and punishment would be coming for this disobedience of the people of Israel, of the people of Judah. But even though they will be punished, they would be punished, there was hope that was coming that is mentioned here. There would be a time for joy and celebration of no more fighting as their enemies would be vanquished. For Zephaniah continues on in verse 15. He says, The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And that there will be no need to fear, he says in verse 16, as the Lord will be in their midst. And it calls him a mighty one who will save. And this harkens back to Isaiah chapter 9 when Isaiah speaks of this child, this promised child, this Messiah who will be born and his name will be called Mighty God, among other names that are mentioned. Also in Isaiah 63 verse 1, speaking again of the Messiah who will come, he will be mighty to save. So taking all these things together from these other places and in here in Zephaniah, as Zephaniah speaks of God being in your midst, which sounds a lot like John chapter 1, verse 14, which says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John speaks of the Word becoming flesh, dwelling among us. Zephaniah speaks of God being in your midst. He speaks of this, that He will be mighty to save, that He will be clearing away the enemies, the enemies of sin and death that Jesus ultimately conquers. These things, they point to Jesus. They point to this promised Messiah when He will come to the earth. But also when you look at this kind of language used here, that He will clear away your enemies... Just an interesting note, things like this, when the Israelites 
in the New Testament, you see that they thought that this Messiah that would come would be there to literally conquer their enemies, to, rid, to get rid of the Romans who were ruling over the Israelites and uh, deliver them from these things because it speaks of the deliverance from these enemies. Although we know that that was not what Jesus came for. Not to conquer their literal political enemies, their oppressors, but rather when Jesus came, He conquered the enemies he conquered the power of sin and death. And He would take away their power for all who would believe in Jesus, who, for all who would follow Him. So again, as we continue on, in verse 17, we see it says that the Lord your God is in your midst. He is a mighty one who will save, and He will rejoice over you with gladness. So again, we see this word rejoice. We think of joy. But the first time where we saw this word, it was called, calling the people to rejoice in the Lord, to sing to Him. But now it says that the Lord is rejoicing over His people as they return to Him, as they follow Him. He will rejoice over them and exalt them with loud singing. And this reminds of the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15. If you're familiar with this story, this parable that Jesus shared, He shared about the shepherd who would leave the 99 sheep that were there to seek the one lost sheep. And then after this parable is shared, it says in verse 7 of Luke chapter 15, uh, Jesus says, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then in verse 10, following the next parable, Jesus says, There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So the question is, do we consider this? Do we consider the joy, the rejoicing that happens in heaven over one person who chooses to repent and to follow Jesus? When we live our lives, when we go through each day, when we meet people, when we consider our own friends and family who are not following God, well, do we think of the rejoicing in heaven that would happen if they would choose to follow Jesus, to give their lives up to Him? Do we realize that this happened when we made the choice to follow Him? Do we consider the rejoicing in heaven when we made the choice to follow Jesus ourselves? Do we meditate? Do we think of the fact that God loves us? Do we remember that? Do we think upon that each day? I know some days it's not easy to think of that, to remember that, and to even realize that truth that God loves us, because maybe sometimes you don't feel that love, or you don't think upon it. I know I don't. Do we realize that God not only loves us, but that God loves each and every person upon this earth that we run into? I'll admit, sometimes it is hard to show love to other people. It can be very hard to love someone who wrongs you, who has done something to you. It can be hard to react with love when you get cut off in traffic or any other kind of situation that you go through in the day. It can be hard to show love to someone who mistreats you over and over and over and over throughout your life. But when we feel this way, when we don't feel the love, when we don't want to show love to these people, we need to come before the Lord to ask Him to fill us with His love for others and not our own limited sense of love. For if we could love the people around us with even a tiny fraction of the love that God has for them, what an impact we could have on the people around us each and every day. So now, as we look towards the end of this passage, we hear of the ways still, even furthermore, that God promises to restore His people. He promises to deal with their oppressors, to save the lame and the outcast, to change people's shame into praise. And where God's people, where the people that He's speaking to had once been cast out, where they had been exiled, where they had been punished for their sin and rejection of God, they will one day be Called renowned, they will one day be renowned and praised among all people on the earth, as it says in verse 20. They had been rejected, but one day they would be renowned. These are hopeful words for a people in a hopeless situation. Hopeful words for them, that something that they could look forward to. 
So as we consider these words, as we consider this passage and the prof, what the prophet Zephaniah had to say to these people, as we consider this Advent season, as we look at these candles and think about approaching Christmas together, may we feel this hope as well that the people could feel in this situation as we look forward to celebrating Jesus' birth. For as I mentioned, the audience hearing these words from Zephaniah were in a hopeless place. They had seen the exile of the other Israelites. They had seen the punishment of the nations around them. And they were hearing of this punishment that would soon be upon them. And perhaps in this season of Advent, you find yourself in a similar situation to these people of Judah. Perhaps things haven't been going well. Perhaps it feels like everything is going wrong. Perhaps it feels like everything is falling apart. And it feels like you don't know where to turn at this time. If you're in that place today, if you have been in that place, turn to Jesus this Christmas. Remember the hope that He offers. The joy that He brought upon the earth when He came to the earth. For we are never promised that our lives will be perfect. We are never promised that our lives will be without pain. Rather, we are promised of a place one day where there will be no sickness, where there will be no pain where there will be no crying and where there will be no death. And what hope that may offer us this morning. But perhaps this season you find yourself in a good place. Perhaps things are going well. Perhaps life is enjoyable for you. Praise God. All the more reason to rejoice this Advent season. Thanking God and praising Him for His good gifts. And for the greatest gift that we could ever hope to receive, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So I hope that as we reflect on these words, as we continue to prepare for Christmas together through the Advent season, may we rejoice together as we look forward to this Christmas season together, as we celebrate Jesus' birth, and we remember all that Him coming to earth means for us today. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you this morning. We're so thankful for who you are, for this uh, word from Zephaniah, Lord, thinking of the situation that these people were in, this difficult, hopeless place that they found themselves, Lord, not knowing where to turn, not knowing what was going to happen for them in the future, but that they did hear of this future one day that they could look forward to, where they would be renowned among all the earth, Lord. We thank you for Jesus as we consider his coming at Christmas time, Lord God, and we pray that it would be a blessing to us, uh, not only today, but as we continue to approach Christmas and and beyond that as well, Lord God. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Please stand as we sing our closing song.